All right, Bible warfare, how to defend your faith, lesson six, what makes the church of Christ unique? This is part two. So in our class, we're answering various questions about the Bible and religion that we have been asked by other people. Review our ground rules when answering uh, questions or having a discussion on religious issues or Bible issues. Respect other people's sincerity. Always keep it biblical. Be patient. Be patient. Of course, these rules can't always be practiced. For example, you're being aggressively ridiculed and dismissed. You know, Jesus said not to cast our pearls before swine, Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, meaning that not all are ready or willing to hear God's word. So we have to know when to speak and sometimes when to remain silent. You know, sometimes it's a good time not to say anything. We need to be able to discern that. Or maybe the other person completely rejects the Bible, does not even want it as part of the discussion. I have been told, just shut the Bible, I don't want to hear it, I'll let you know. Anytime I want to know something about the Bible, I know exactly who to go see. But until that time, you just, you know, I don't want to hear it. Well, you know what? We don't have any other basis to discuss Jesus and the gospel without the Bible in the equation. You know, if, if we can't discuss the Bible, then you know, we, we can discuss philosophy and you know, perhaps I can challenge some of your humanistic ideas, but I can't preach the gospel to you if I, if I can't make reference to the Bible. Paul refers uh, to the uh, revelation of Christ and His resurrection you know, when he was on Mars Hills in um, Acts chapter 17, 22, you know, in Greece, speaking to these philosophers, these wise individuals. But when they didn't want to hear him anymore, when they cut him off, he just, he left. So our rules of engagement, they're not absolutes. They're guidelines to help us have a productive and loving communication with someone about the scriptures. Okay, tonight we're going to finish second part of last week's questions. So last week the question was, I began answering a group of questions, but the basic question was, what's the difference between the church of Christ and you fill in the blank? Now my first reply was the short version. The, the, the difference between the churches of Christ and all others is that we strive to be a New Testament church. That's always the short answer. If someone says, so what's the difference between, you know, I don't go to your church, so what's the difference? I, I always start with that. Well, the churches of Christ are New Testament churches. And the reason that I start with that is that it'll invite another question. Churches of Christ are New Testament churches. Pause. Oh yeah, well, what are New Testament churches? Ah, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Let me open the Bible up. <laughs> My second reply was in the, you know, the long version, and it took up the rest of last week's lesson and most of the one we're going to do now. In that second reply, I tried to explain what a New Testament church was and how it was different. First of all, I said that as a New Testament church, we are different theologically. This meant that we believe that the entire Bible is inspired by God, and it is the final authority in religion, as well as the only authority in religion. So that's the first major way that we are different than other religious groups. I mean, of course, we're different than Hindus and Muslims, but I'm talking about just you know, within Christianity, and I, I use the quotes there, within the larger group of people who say they are believers of Jesus. But the fact that we believe that the entire Bible is fully inspired separates us from most other church groups because many do not accept this idea anymore. I mean, when your sole authority for religion, faith, morals, spiritual life is the Bible, then you're going to reach different conclusions and practices than those who only use part of the Bible 
or those who give equal authority to human religious leaders or traditions. Eventually, you're going to, you're going to part ways. We're also different theologically than others because of the way that we apply the Bible in practical terms in our life. So theoretically we're different because we believe the Bible is fully inspired. Practically we're different in the way that we apply the Bible to our lives, to our practice of our religion. While others use the Bible as a resource book, or a reference book, or a jumping off point for their religious lives, we see the Bible as containing patterns of spiritual and moral, for rather, spiritual and moral living. I said last week, this is called pattern theology. And this is what we practice, pattern theology. It's how we get to our conclusions. We use pattern theology in order to get to a consistent set of conclusions. In other words, the Bible contains patterns or blueprints that enable us to reproduce Bible things in any culture, in any age. Well, why is it that after 2,000 years, communion is with Unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. 2,000 years later, we're still doing the same thing. Why? Because in the Bible, there's a pattern for that. And if you follow that pattern, that's where you're going to get to. For example, through various commands and example, it describes, and the Bible is able to give us a pattern to follow, as I said, if we wish to take the Lord's Supper from the Bible, from that blueprint, from that pattern, we can figure out who takes it. Who takes the communion? Well, believers take the communion. How do we know? In Acts chapter two, the ones who had repented and had been baptized, then took the communion. So who takes the communion? Well, believers, baptized believers, they take the communion. When do you take it? Well, if you read through the book of Acts and other places, you find out on the Lord's day. Which elements do we use? If someone said, you know what, I mean, new Coke, <laughs> or Coke Zero, I mean really, Coke Zero, much tastier, we love the sweetness without the sugar, you know, Coke Zero, all right, and uh, a Danish, I mean, come on. or a nice cup of hot coffee and a Danish. I mean, it's, it's if you're sincere or not, right? We love God, we just, what's the diff? Let's take something that we're going to enjoy the taste. Why not? Why not? Because in the New Testament, there's a pattern for how this is to be done. And it instructs us that we use these elements to, to do it. You see what I'm saying? If you're not committed to this pattern idea, to follow patterns, then eventually you can change everything around to suit you. The Bible tells us how to proceed. It tells us why we should do it. All that information is there. So all of these questions about how to do communion are contained in the, in the Bible, the New Testament. So pattern theology says that the Bible contains a pattern or a blueprint for every aspect of a Christian's life. Second Peter 1.3, an important scripture, I don't think I've got that reference in my little notes there, but you know, Peter tells us that the word gives us everything we need to mature in spirit and in Christ. From how to be a good husband, to how to organize the church, and everything needed for spiritual life in Christ, is in the Bible. How to build a tree house? No. No. You know, how to start a business? No. How to be a good Christian business person, man, woman? Oh, okay, yeah, you'll, you'll find that in here. You, you'll find, 
you know, resources to help you be that person, if that's what you're looking for. And so the churches of Christ are different because we try with various degrees of success to follow the New Testament pattern for every aspect of our personal and congregational life. And other groups do not. I mean, we're not accusing them, you're bad people because, no, I'm just saying that's what, that's what makes us different than other people. For example, we take communion by taking both the bread and the fruit of the vine every Lord's day until Jesus returns. We do it this way because this is the way the New Testament, the churches, the, the, the way the New Testament uh, teaches the church to do it. Those of you who grew up in the Catholic Church, this is a familiar scene. Those of you who have never been, this is how it's done. Roman Catholic Church, they've changed this pattern where only the priest takes both of the elements while he's saying mass. He takes the bread, he drinks the wine. The congregation only takes the bread. Why? Well, because they changed the rules. And you can take the communion any day of the week. Is it, is it, is it a sin to remember Jesus by taking the communion on Monday? Well, I don't know. I do know, however, that in the New Testament, the pattern for how to do that is that it's on the Lord's day. You're dying and you want to take communion one more time and it's Tuesday. Yeah. Most evangelical churches take communion whenever they feel it. Some of them take it every week. Some of them take it once a month. Some of them take it once a year. Who decides when they take it? Not the Bible. Their leaders decide. Their leaders decide, well, we're going to take it here and we're not, not yeah, you know, we're First Baptist, we do it every you know, first, first month, first Sunday of the month, let's say. Oh, but Second Baptist, they do it every week. Well, well, they've decided to do it that way and we decided to do it this way. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not ridiculing them, I'm just saying that's, that's how the, the mind works. But it's not how the New Testament says it should be figured out. The New Testament tells us you want to know how to do Bible things, refer to the Bible. So if you go down the list for every difference between us and other people or other groups or other churches if you wish, it will invariably boil down to this. We seek to speak and to do things specifically according to the pattern and teaching of the New Testament. Nothing more, nothing less. And by the way, I'm not just trying to say I'm not just talking about forms, you know what I mean? The, the proper format on how to do communion, the proper format on how to do baptism. Of course, that's part of it, but also the New Testament pattern for who should be a leader in the church. Well there, it's about character, it's about wisdom, it's about purity. You know, I mean, it's not just rituals that we follow the pattern. We also follow the pattern for, well, how, how are you to be a good husband? Well, there's a pattern in the New Testament for how to be a good husband and to, or to be a good wife or to be an obedient child and how you should react to your parents. You know, there's a pattern for everything, not just the rituals. I, I want to make sure we understand that. Okay? We're not Pharisees. We're not Pharisees. Of course, other people, for various reasons, have chosen to change or delete or add laws or traditions and doctrines that cannot be supported by the New Testament. Hey, a parade with 10,000 people marching down the streets with pictures of Jesus and, and, and statues of Mary that they're carrying and they're, everybody's dressed with flowers and isn't that nice? Well, yeah, there's nothing, quote, immoral about that. It just doesn't have any biblical support for itself. It's man's idea. You know, human beings figured out, hey, maybe God would like this. Let's go for it. Nothing holding them back. In the churches of Christ, if somebody comes up with an idea like this, I remember in Montreal, of course, a very Catholic, so the people who, be, 
you know, became members of the church came from a, a Catholic background. The majority of them came from a Catholic background. <laughs> Invariably, somebody would come up and says, I have a great idea. Really? Yeah. I have a great idea. Brother Mike, you know what we need to do? What do we need? We need to raffle off a car. Really? Yes, yes, yes. In a way to make money for the church. They were sincere. Then we take money out of the budget. We can buy a nice car. And then we'll sell tickets. You know, the members will go sell tickets at work and this and that. You know, we'll raise money in order to fix the church building or whatever. Were they sincere? Well, of course they were sincere. Where were they drawing this idea from? Well, I know where they were drawing the idea from. That's what they do in the Catholic Church. And for me, that was an opportunity to sit down and say, OK, well, let me just show you something. You know, I, I would ask him first, OK, where in the Bible do you see anything like that? I don't mean a car, but you know, and it would give me an opportunity to show him that there's really just one way that we raise money in the New Testament church. And how is that? Well, that's through a free will offering of each member. Oh, same thing, you know, or someone who would come out of an evangelical or Protestant background. Uh, what's the tithe supposed to be? Okay. You know, well, the tithe, you know, I teach them about Old Testament laws and rules and how that played a part in that, but that's not in the New Testament. Oh, so why do we do it this way? Well, because we have a pattern for how we give and, and how we figure out what we give and the attitude we should have when we give and for what purpose do we give. All right, so a little bit of review. So this week, some of the questions covers and reconfirms some of the material we talked about last week. All right. This week we answer some questions that may arise when you explain the idea of New Testament Christianity and pattern theology. First question is, well, why should we do it this way? Who said? You know, why pattern theology? Did we in the churches of Christ arbitrarily choose this approach? to Bible study and application? Did we invent this quote hermeneutic? The answer is no. We use pattern theology for several reasons. First, it is the approach that we see the Old Testament patriarchs and leaders use in their relationship with God and His word. We're copying what they did. I mean, you can go all the way back to Genesis. Cain and Abel's offerings were rejected or accepted because of the way they offered their sacrifices in accordance to God's will, including the attitude of the heart and the manner in which they were offered. One was acceptable, the other was not. The difference, one had the, the attitude and the manner that God desired and the other did not. Noah built the ark according to um, the plan or pattern given to him by God. No, you know, he could have said, you know, I, I know about boats, but wait a minute, there's no, there's no sail on this boat. There's no rudder on this boat. There's only one door on this boat. So you know what, I mean, you know, everybody knows a boat has to have a sail. I'll just add a sail, just be between, you know? No, he built the boat the way God gave him to build the ark, even though it made no sense, even though he had to build it on land. You know, when you build a boat, most shipyards, I'm going to give you a little tip here, most shipyards are located near water. <laughs> it's just a thing, you know what I'm saying? Moses built the tabernacle exactly as God gave him instructions. And if you read in, in Exodus, I think there's like five chapters of instructions for the tabernacle, the hooks, the poles, everything. Solomon built the temple and instituted worship exactly according to the plans given to him by God through his father David, 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 5. And so in these and many other examples, we see the people of God performing their worship and living out their faith and their service in accordance to the instructions given to them by God. This is, we didn't invent that. That's the way man has responded to God from the very beginning. 
or it's the way God has wanted man to respond to him. We also see that when they did not follow the instructions, they were punished. For example, King Saul lost the kingdom because he did not follow exactly God's instructions through Samuel the prophet. Samuel said, wait for me, I will come and offer the sacrifice before you go into battle. And Saul saw some of his men getting a little antsy, you know, come on, let's go, hurry up. You know, he said, oh, I'll offer, I mean, it's a sacrifice, I know how to do it, and I'm the king. What could go wrong? Well, plenty, as we find out if we read his life. So this approach of obeying and following God's given instructions is summarized in 1 Kings as God speaks to Solomon at the dedication of the temple. We'll read that. It says, as for you, if you will walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and will keep my statutes and my ordinances then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, just as I promised to your father David, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons indeed turn away from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, and go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and the house which I have consecrated for my name, I will cast out of my sight. So Israel will become a proverb and a byword to all peoples. When he talks about commands and statutes and ordinances, these three words encompass all of the instructions and judgments given by God to His people. God Himself says, you follow my instructions, and if you do, I'll bless you. If you don't, I'll punish you. Another reason for our use of pattern theology is that the New Testament also teaches that this is to be the approach we take in regards to applying the Bible to our lives. A Couple of scriptures. Matthew 28, 20, that's the Great Commission, you know, going to all the world, preach the, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then he says, and teaching them to observe, teaching who? Teaching the disciples, these new Christians, right? Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. It isn't teaching them what I have commanded you. It's teaching them what? Teaching them to obey all of the commands that I have given you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So we're to follow the commands of Jesus. In other words, whatever the New Testament tells us to do, we must do. We must love one another. We must ab ab abstain from sin, take the communion, preach the word. I mean, all of these things are Jesus' commands. We must know and obey His commands, whether they are spoken by Him or later given by the apostles. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Paul says, be imitators of me, just as also I also am of Christ. Not all issues or teachings are put forth as commands or instructions. You know, it'd be nice if it was do this, don't do that. Be, you know, we could at least follow that. But some things we learn by copying the examples given to us by Christ and His apostles. For example, how to deal with temptation and adversity. Well, we have a pattern for that. We have, we have things in the Bible that teach us how to deal with adversity, how to deal with temptation, how to worship God properly, how to organize the church in the way God wants it organized, how to do mission work, how to resolve problems within the church. Many of these things we learn from the pattern of examples given to us by Jesus, the apostles, and other biblical characters. I mean, isn't that what you do when you're learning a trade? I mean, I never learned a trade. My trade is this here, but you know, well, even in teaching, I remember I used to teach you know, public school, Catholic school. I mean, you, you do your courses and you do you know, the, the classwork that you do, but a lot of the, the learning is you going into a classroom watching someone teach. 
If you want to become a master carpenter, I mean, <laughs> a lot of that is watching a master carpenter at work. And he, gives, he or she gives you certain tasks and sees that you're doing and you know, trains you. Well, the Bible is like that. We watch the characters in the Bible and how they acted and what they did and how they responded and we, you know, we, follow, we follow suit. Second Timothy 1.13, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Paul here is telling Timothy, the younger preacher, to retain the standard. There's the pattern, that word, pattern. Another meaning of it, sketch. Of proper solid teaching, sound teaching is proper solid teaching which Paul has entrusted to him. When doing his work, Timothy is to refer to the doctrines and the teachings which have been given to him. He doesn't make them up. He doesn't do a variation. Paul has tasked him to you know, completely you know, bring into his generation what he's been taught by Paul. We have the exact same pattern of teaching from Christ through the gospels and epistles that have been handed down to us today and we're to do the same thing, to hand it off to the next generation so that they may continue following the pattern. Of course, with the help of God's word, with the help of the Holy Spirit, with the help of more mature adult Christians. One other scripture, Jude 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. I've used this scripture before. The idea, a little background here is that Jude was going to write to these brethren about something specific, a problem taking place you know, in the church, and then he says he felt it necessary to change his idea and instead appeal that they contend earnestly for the faith. In other words, that they struggle to maintain the body of doctrine that had been given to them by the apostles once and for all. That's what this passage means. That the early church received the body of teaching about Christianity. And Jude here is saying, your task, you the church, your task is to make sure that you maintain this body of teaching intact. Maintain its integrity. And your task is to pass along this body of knowledge and teaching exactly as it is to the next generation and make sure they understand that their task is to then pass it on to the next generation intact from one generation down to Another, well, how do you do this? You know, how, how, how do you do that? The, the, this, how do you do that? Pattern theology. How do you approach it to, to keep it the way it is and to you know, not spill any of it when you pass it on? Pattern theology. It's a method, it's a system, it's an approach that guarantees that we continually arrive at the proper conclusions that God wants us to arrive at using His word. So all the teaching, sound words, doctrine, pattern, whatever you want to call it, all of it has been given to us and there is no more. All these sects, well, what's the same th Christian sects? Well, what's the common thing about them? They have a prophet who all of a sudden decides, man or woman, decides they have a new revelation from God. Well, the only problem with that is it, it goes against what Jude said, he says it's been given once for all, once for all means there ain't no more. And so in the New Testament, through various commands, examples, and teachings, we have a pattern for Christian living and practice. The New Testament, through Christ and His apostles, tell us that we have the entire pattern and that we must follow it in order to reproduce the Christian life 
and Christian practice that God wants of us in every single age. In other words, the conduct of the church and the way that it worships God is exactly the same from generation to generation. If you went back 2,000 years, you know, time machine if you could. You know, if you went back 2,000 years and entered a church, a Christian church of the time, I mean, aside from the culture and the language things, you would recognize what's going on. Oh, they're taking communion. <laughs> oh, somebody's coming forward to be baptized. You, know, you would recognize, you'd say, okay, I know, I, I'm in the right place. If you went into a Christian church 2,000 years ago and people were kneeling down in front of a statue and doing this here, you'd say, okay, I'm not in the right place. The New Testament even warns that there will be an apostasy, meaning a following away. Apostasy means there's a standard, you're here. Apostasy means this is happening. Falling away from an established standard. That's apostasy. So the New Testament tells us that there will be an apostasy from this approach and to guard against the impulse to change or add or delete any of the teaching of this pattern. That's what Paul is warning the elders uh, when he meets with them, uh, the elders from, uh, from uh, Ephesus in Acts chapter 20. Uh, that's what he exhorts them to be careful of. And so through Jesus and the apostles, we have a pattern, we have a blueprint in the New Testament that guides every aspect of our Christian lives. The church of Christ is different because it tries to obey the Bible's command to follow only the pattern in the New Testament for Christian life and practice. Okay, next question. When did we start doing this? Ever since the church was established and the New Testament given and circulated in the church and throughout the world, there has been a constant struggle to stay true to the pattern. Even during their own lifetimes, the apostles were warning the church not to abandon this practice or to return to it if they had strayed. Acts 27, Paul is warning the elders. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, Paul is warning the Corinthians. Jude 3, Jude is warning the entire church. Throughout later history, this falling away was experienced as Christianity fell further and, you know, further and further away from the original pattern contained in the New Testament to a point where Christianity was barely recognizable anymore. And then in the 1500s, Martin Luther attempted a return to a more biblical form of Christianity. I mean, his, his war cry was, back to the Bible. Why did he say that? Because he was a biblical scholar, that's why. <laughs> he knew how to read the Greek. He knew how to read the Hebrew. He was reading, and what he read was not at all what was taking place. And I, to tell you the truth, it's the reason I left the Catholic Church. I start, you know, they say to me, How, what's the best way to, to, you know, to, to bring a Catholic? <laughs> Just get them to read the Bible. I've told you the story. I, I mean, I read the Bible and my first reaction, anger. I was so mad. What? I was reading that, what? And I remember the last time I spoke to a priest, he said to me, you know what, you're never going to make it without us. I said, well, I'm going to try. And then when I found a Pentecostal group, you know, and remember I told you, the one good thing about them is they pointed me towards the Bible. They had a lot of weird practices and stuff, but at least they said, no, no, it's in here. You know, forget your Catholic catechism here. Here's the truth in here. Oh, well, great. And I started reading it. <laughs> and I mean, I was reading and I was watching what they were doing and I said, well, no, you're not doing what's in here. And I said, okay, I'm done. You know? And you know what the, the chief guy said to me when I, when I was leaving? <laughs> he said, you're never going to make it without us. I said, yeah, well, I heard that before. <laughs> His lead, Martin Luther, resulted in the Protestant Reformation, which in turn gave rise to a new variety of Christian churches and practices. Unfortunately, these quickly fell into the same mistakes as their predecessors. You know, a lot of high, you know, what I call high church, you know, 
old time denominational Protestantism, you go into those churches, you can't tell the difference between is it a Catholic church or is it a Protestant church? I mean, the only difference is no Pope, but everybody's got the long gowns and you know, the high church thing. They didn't follow closely the pattern in the New Testament and resulted in thousands of Protestant evangelical sectarian groups that we have today. All claim Christ, but none pursue their faith using the exclusive pattern contained in the New Testament. Each have added, changed, deleted from the pattern to form their own brand. Why is it I can always spot a Lutheran church? Just by their building, I don't have to, I don't, I don't have to, I don't have to you know, look at their, just their building, they have a building style when they build. Lutheran. You have other churches, they have, they've actually branded their own logo. So that's what's happened. Everybody went their own way, away from the pattern, designed their own pattern, branded their own denomination. Even today they continue to add new groups who have improvised their own style of Christianity to suit their times and their purposes. You know, what was the big thing? <laughs> You know, community churches, that was the new brand a couple of years back. You know, everybody was a community church. I mean, they were all evangelical churches, but they were community churches. Why? Because that was the big thing now. I remember there was a church that was a holiness church. Okay? They had a sign out front. Holiness, you know, Midwest City Holiness Church. You know? And uh, all of a sudden, you know, for years they were that. And then all of a sudden the, the community church bandwagon came through town and they changed, they changed their sign and all of a sudden now they were the holiness community church. <laughs> you know. It's branding. Now in the 1700s, scholars and preachers from various Protestant groups began to preach and teach that the true source and the only source for Christian life and practice was the Bible. These men left their denominational backgrounds and they began to teach that all should return to the Bible and only the Bible as the pattern for Christianity. They attempted to restore, that was the idea, to restore New Testament Christianity as it was presented and patterned in the New Testament. They were thrown out of their churches, they were disowned by their denominations, but first in Europe, and then to a great degree in the United States, the restoration movement, as it was called, began to catch fire. Men like Barton W. Stone, Alexander Campbell, Thomas Campbell, Walter Scott, and others began a religious revolution that swept the nation for almost 200 years. Eventually, those who believed and practiced their faith using only the Bible came to be known as the churches of Christ. As the Bible referred to the church in Romans chapter 16, verse 16. Paul ends his letter and says, the churches of Christ salute you. And that's where our restoration churches, that's where they got their name. We got our name. There are now tens of thousands of congregations known as Churches of Christ throughout the world, and except for language and cultural differences, they're all the same. This is because each congregation follows only the pattern in the Bible for Christian life and the organization and function of the church. We here at Choctaw, we are the 21st century version of this restoration movement, and like those who came before us, we continue to pursue our Christian life by following the original pattern given to us by Christ and His apostles in the Bible, and we do it because the Bible says that this is the way we are supposed to approach our study and our practice of our faith. One last thing, and some of you may be thinking, why are there then divisions even within the churches of Christ? This final question asks, why are there divisions or different types of churches of Christ? There are several groups with, uh, with, uh, within mainline churches of Christ that have different practices. 
uh, concerning uh, mission work, how to do mission work, how to do the communion, the use of the building, but all of these remain committed to pattern theology approach. They simply come to a different conclusion on some, not all issues. So the different groups within restoration churches, mainline churches of Christ, that's us, the largest of the groups, disciples of Christ and Christian churches, these two groups began to veer off the, you know, the pattern theology idea because they began to uh, uh, assert that not all the Bible was inspired. And then you have the International Church of Christ. So the reason for this division is the same as for every other division in the history of the church. A refusal to follow carefully the pattern established in the New Testament. So disciples of Christ and Christian churches they have forsaken the principle that the entire Bible is inspired. How does that happen? Well, one of their ministers you know, goes to Harvard, or goes to Yale, or goes to one of these Ivy League schools, these liberal you know, universities. Remember I told you, you come out of Harvard School of Religion, you're lucky if you can still believe in God, let alone the Bible. And they come back and they start teaching and you know, plant doubt in the minds of people concerning the Bible, or they use the higher, critical, higher criticism method of interpretation. Um, of course, this has led them to having instruments in worship and women as elders and ministers and other non-biblical practices. The international churches of Christ refuse to accept the New Testament as the final authority and they give their leaders more power than the Bible gives to church leaders. If you've ever wondered, what's the main difference? That's the main difference. And this has led to abuse and charges that this group is a sect. In the end, the departure from principles that the Bible is inspired and it contains the patterns for acceptable Christian life and practice are always what caused division and the creation of new and different churches. Please remember that. Why are they different? Why did they break up? Always the same reason. They move away from this idea of following the patterns every time. They're different because they are not like the, they're not like the pattern given in the New Testament. However, however, I want you to note that among Baptist churches, just here in the United States, there are 62 different Baptist groups in the United States alone. And I was doing some research online, I couldn't count how many there were in the world. I, could, I don't mean 62 different churches, 62 different associations that govern churches. So let's make sure that we remain faithful to the twin foundations of inspired text and pattern theology as the solid base for a church and a Christian life that God will be well pleased with. Okay, we're a little, a little long, sorry about that. We'll keep answering those questions. We'll have some more next week. Thank you very much. <laughs>